Dagda. Order of Battle. Primary forces committed to the Dagda campaign. Clan Barok Cluster. Commanders, Khan Herv Polchik. Sarkhan Nigel Polchik. Led by twin brothers from the Rimworlds Republic, the warriors of Clan Barok made up for what they lacked in innovation and responsiveness with a single-minded determination that bordered on the obsessive. Heavy and assault mechs predominated in their five battle mech stars, and their two aerospace stars followed a similar pattern. The single Barok vehicle star stood in stark contrast to the other forces, favouring light, agile scout vehicles. Clan Fire Mandrel Cluster, Commanders Khan Raymond Saints, Sarkhan Laura Payne. The members of the Clan Fire Mandrel were proud of their prowess as warriors and went to great lengths to demonstrate their abilities to others. This led to a competitive spirit within the clan that was both a boon and a curse. The warriors were driven to excel, but they rarely made good team players. Like most of the clans, battle mechs dominated in the cluster, but small cliques began to emerge around the other unit types, and the mech warrior community eventually fragmented into several cliques, each seeking to prove their superiority of their bloodlines. These groups would later be known as Kindred Associations, or Kindrask, the forerunners of the modern Kindra. Clan Goliath Scorpion Cluster, Commanders Khan Cyrus Elam, Sarkhan Jenna Scott. The antithesis of Clan Barok, the Goliath Scorpion Warriors favoured a flexible approach to their mission and built their forces appropriately, with each star containing a mix of battle mechs, vehicles and aerospace fighters. The only single function star in this cluster was the Special Forces Infantry Squad, led by Naomi Jirassi, who served as scouts, spotters or saboteurs as their mission dictated. All were also fully trained combat engineers. Clan Widowmaker Cluster Commanders Khan Jason Carriage, Sarkhan Marielle Sanders. Clan Widowmaker favoured hard hitting tactics and operated oversized combined armed stars, each of which had integral aerospace forces. The frontline stars contained no infantry or vehicles, though the clan did make use of such troops in rear echelon security detachments. Employing such troops freed up the bulk of the cluster for combat operations, but also drew criticism from the other clans, most notably their rivals in the Reaver campaign the Baroques, who claimed their presence of these security personnel represented a stealthy enhancement of the Widowmaker Talman beyond the 40 warriors assigned by Nicholas. Dagda Scheduled to start at the same time as the other Klondike assaults, the Dagda campaign got off to a bad start when a blown jump ship helium seal stranded part of the fleet at Stranameshti. Rather than start the campaign piecemeal, Kerensky ordered the Dagda operation postponed, while repairs were enacted. Combat operations against Dagda finally began on 22nd of July, with Pathfinder units from Clan Barok jumping into a pirate point near Med, the largest of the planet's moons. There they met no immediate resistance, making several low passes over Medbian mining complexes and finding them abandoned. Two were found to be in good working order, their reserves of fuel and oxygen intact despite decades of war at one of them. Automated drones continue to extract the materials despite their abandonment at another, and the stockpiles becoming the subject of a series of trials of possession before the Ilkhan intervened and ordered the materials to be held as a common resource until the end of the operation. All four clans assigned to Dagda, the Baroks, Fire Mandrels, Goliath Scorpions and Widowmakers, launched reconnaissance missions against Dagda itself from the Medbian bases updating their maps with details of the extant settlements and strategic targets. What they found was a world that had fallen far from its pre-exodus days, the population now having dwindled to scarcely 440,000 souls, most of whom lived a subsistence existence that would have been familiar to the populace who experienced the Napoleonic Wars. That wasn't to say that the Dagdens didn't have advanced technologies. Pockets remained. But like the other Pentagon populations, most of these advanced systems were reserved for the political and military elite. Indeed, a drafted soldier might use a laser carbine and a wear a molecularly aligned armour while serving in the army of his feudal overlord, but upon returning home would rely on wood or peat for cooking and heating, and on horses for transport and to plough their fields. The harsh conditions on Dagda meant that the loss of advanced technologies had a more profound effect than on the other Pentagon worlds, even bitter Circe, with many of the upland regions abandoned, 
the atmosphere too thin to support life without technological aid. Likewise, many of the deep sea complexes, including all but three of the great artificial atolls, were abandoned. No one faction dominated on Dagda, but rather the population was divided between two dozen warlords, some of whom were benevolent despots, but the majority of which were little more than thugs. However, they were all well-armed thugs, with access to significant amounts of military hardware and a battle-hardened populace. These proto-states were scattered across the planet's six continents, but the clans targeted ten key factions, whose destruction would, they hoped, bring the collapse of the others. Firebase Delta The honour of the first landings on Dagda itself was won by Clan Goliath Scorpion, whose ability to both capture enemy positions and hold them against enemy counterattack had impressed the Il Khan in the pre-Klondike trials. With this in mind, the Scorpions were assigned one of the toughest challenges of the campaign, the destruction of the Macmillan Collective, one of the strongest factions on the planet whose base of operations was Firebase Delta one of the few surviving space defence system facilities in the Pentagon. Located in the mountainous Satan's Table volcanic uplands of Riva, Dagda's smallest continent, the neutralisation of this base was a vital objective and had to be undertaken prior to the main landings on Tenno and Drafa if massive casualties were to be avoided. The Macmillans were of principally hegemony stock and were equipped with some of the most sophisticated military equipment the clans would face in the campaign, including more than a company of battle mechs. Their leader, James McMillan, was a decorated veteran of Alexander Kerensky's operations to liberate terror, and while he was of advancing years, his martial skill had allowed him to establish and maintain his petty fiefdom for the best part of two decades. It would be a hard fight, but it was one that the Scorpions relished. In the small hours of the 29th of July, Sarkhan Jenna Scott led the initial assault on the Macmillan compound, dropping from the Venom's Kiss, a modified torrent-heavy bomber encased in ablative cocoons too small for the SDS system to target. Assaulting the compound directly, Scott's binary took the defenders by surprise and were able to seize their communication center before a significant defense could be mounted. Without secure communications, the Macmillans were in a difficult position despite their numerical advantage, and their attempts to counterattack the main Scorpion landings were, quite literally, nothing more than thrashing about in the dark. By the time dawn broke, Firebase Delta was in clan hands. Though short, the operation to seize Delta was costly for the Scorpions, with nine members of one binary, almost a quarter of their entire strength, killed in a single incident when the defenders triggered a booby trap and dropped the attackers into molten lava. Only a single warrior managed to leap free of the trap. Another three mechs were lost in the week-long dismantling of the collective led by Khan Cyrus Elam, a bloody game of cat and mouse that culminated with the death of James McMillan at the hands of Sarkhan Scott. With their leader dead, the rest of the collective defence crumbled, and the Scorpions began operations to assert their control over the region, disarming local groups and liaising with civilian authorities. The door to the rest of Dagda opened, and the main landings by clans Widowmaker and Barak began on the 12th of August. Bloody Sarlo Assigned to operations on Sarlo, the star-shaped continent in Dagda's western hemisphere, and thus out of the range of Delta's massive weapons, Clan Firemandrel was able to preempt this start date, and began their landings on the 30th of July. The initial landing did not go well. With a navigation error scattering two binaries along the lowlands of the western coast, while numerous supply pallets were scattered across the slopes of the Mount Luca Stratovolcano, hampering Mandrel operations until they could be recovered. The various factions of the Mandrels immediately began to squabble, initially over matters like botched landings and missing supplies, but soon escalating into military matters, with bidding for combat assignments often reaching dangerously low levels. In years to come, the concept of the cutdown the point beyond which a force was too small to accomplish its task, would become enshrined in clan bidding, but in Operation Klondike, the clan's first experience with large-scale warfare, the concept was still nebulous, and the fire mandrels paid the price. Khan Raymond Saints and Sarkhan Laura Payne were no less competitive than the rest of their clan, and the two leaders soon began rivals in the operations against the Dagden enclaves on Salo. At each step of the way, they bid against one another for the honour of storming successive bastions, maintaining a rapid pace, but at a significant cost. 
The borderline numbers of troops committed to each battle placed extra stresses on the participants, resulting in a higher rate of damage and injury than operational planning had allowed for. The loss of supplies on Mount Luca, only half of which had been recovered, began to bite. Mechs were sent out with incomplete or jury-rigged repairs, or short of ammunition. It was the start of a vicious cycle that looked set to persist throughout the campaign. Fortunately for the Mandrels, though their opponents were tenacious and numerous, their equipment was at the poorer end of what was available on Dagda. Slug throwers and tanks rather than particle cannons and blazers, and thus the Mandrels were able to win through an inoperation that saw rival teams leapfrogging around each other on the coast. The Night Labyrinth, a vast area of canyons and rocky outcrops, was the last refuge of the Mandrels' opponents, and hunting down the enemy should have been a straightforward search-and-destroy operation, with hunter-killer squads guided to their targets by aerial and satellite reconnaissance. Khan Saint and Payne bid away such resources in their effort to gain glory for the fight, and as a consequence, the hunt dragged on for weeks. Though they were never formally censured, the performance of the Mandrel Khans drew considerable criticism from the Ill Khan, Nicholas deemed the materiel and personnel losses suffered by the clan unduly wasteful, and as a consequence, was wary of their involvement in the campaign, something that would have significant repercussions as the campaign drew to a close. Investing Dratha Clans Widowmaker and Barok gathered their resources as the Goliath Scorpion secured Reaver, occasionally bidding against the other clan for the right to stage combat patrols or for supplies and Izola. For the most part, they stood ready for the Ilkhan's order to attack, which were received by HBG late on the 17th of August. Within 90 minutes, at just after midnight local time, the first clan troops were landing on Dratha, a joint Widowmaker Barok commando squad paradropping into the port city of Falka. Situated at the base of the Rose Peninsula, this was the capital of the Maritime Hales Commonwealth, and its almost immediate loss crippled the local forces. The Widowmaker elements of the team struck at the Commonwealth Command and Control facilities, while the Baroques boarded the coastal cutter Fastidious, which they promptly scuttled in the harbour mouth, trapping the rest of the fleet in port. With the enemy now contained, the main clan force staged a hybrid amphibious suborbital landing to the east of the city, cutting the main road out of town. The Commonwealth troops refused to be cowed, however, and ten days of street fighting and house-to-house -house engagements were necessary before the bridgehead was secured and the operations could begin in earnest against forces on Dratha. There were several reasons for choosing Falka as the bridgehead. It was a major port with easy naval access to Riva and the clan supply line. It was also a very defensible site, with either the sea or the vast uplands dominating all but the eastern approaches and it was within striking range of the Orienta Dominion, a militaristic group of free world's origin, and Ryan's Roughnecks, a lawless thugocracy whose leaders were accused of a succession of war crimes. Airstrikes and raids began against the two proto-states even before Falker was secured. The Dominion mounted an air raid against the Widowmaker Cantonment, but the aircraft were decrepit and their pilots inexperienced, resulting in their swift downing with minimal damage to the clans. The attack drew an immediate response, with two points of Widowmaker aerospace fighters pounding the Dominion capital, uh, Tuidad Orienta, and quickly establishing aerospace superiority over the zone. Daily raids by the Widowmakers, and later the Baroques, provided the pilots of a chance to hone their skills, while the remainder of the forces secured Falka and moved against their first strategic objective, a collection of agrarian collectives on the Imbros Plains. With little martial skill, these city-states were in reality nothing more than farming communities who had been subjected by one or other of the mil militaristic factions. They put up minimal resistance to the clan occupation. Most of those who did fight were in the pay of the Roughnecks or the Dominion, and initially regarded the Winnemakers and Baroques as another set of military occupiers. Expecting to have their food stolen, their men conscripted and their women raped, the people of Imbros were stunned to find themselves invited to sit in on the councils of these invaders, their views and local knowledge welcomed by the members of the civilian castes who were serving in the clan's support echelons, and who oversaw the administrative elements of the occupation. Yes, the clans did want food supplies from the Imbros collectives, but they would pay with materials, technology, and expertise, as there would be no monetary economy until after the end of Operation Klondike. The collectives willingly submitted to the rule of the clans, seeing in them the hope of a free and just future. It was the first great victory on Dagda, 
and it's still celebrated by some rural Dagden communities as part of the Harvest Festival. The Chosen Throughout August and September, Clan Goliath of Scorpion continued its operations on Reva, crushing a succession of proto-states and securing the mineral extraction operations of Graz and Borodino. The latter was very nearly undid as the Scorpion's efforts on Riva erupting in violence ten days after the occupation when rumours of clan atrocities began to circulate. A number of clan infantry were slain by rioters before the situation was brought under control, though the casualties of the pacification operations did little to calm matters. The clans were a military force, not one geared for policing, and it soon became apparent that the stories about the clans had originated with another proto-state who sought to undermine the occupation. They'd provided the arms used by the rioters as well. There was little the Scorpions could do to assuage the fears instilled in the populace of Borodino, but they could dispense justice against the perpetrators, a theocratic group known as The Chosen. These were not a faith per se, but rather a religious cult centred on the charismatic Colleen Escher, a former SLDF officer of Lyran heritage. Escher's group was, to all intents, a doomsday cult, who viewed the Exodus and the Pentagon War as a literal Armageddon that could only be survived by adherence to her ideals. Taking as their base of operations an old mining facility on the edge of the uplands, now fortified and accessible by ascending a single narrow pass, the Chosen believed themselves secure against all but the most determined assault. They had reckoned without the clans, whose mechs, tanks and Starly gear or combat infantry gear was more than sufficient to brave the thin air around the monastery. Khan Elam led a mixed armour and mech force up to the approach of the citadel, advancing under the guns of the defenders and maintaining intense pressure with long-range missile fire, airstrikes and artillery barrages. Despite his efforts, progress was slow, and the Chosen may have begun to think they could escape clan justice. Then Sarkhan Scott's troops appeared and drove into the flank. Having advanced at speed over the high plateaus, a route deemed impassable by conventional Dagdom wisdom, her assault was like a hammer on glass. The Chosen shattered and their unit integrity collapsed, their forces crushed piecemeal between the forces of Khan Elam and Sarkhan Scott. Despite the loss of their military, the leadership of the Chosen remained holed up in the monastery and refused to surrender. The Scorpions were wary of an assault so high in the mountains, any significant damage to the structure would have compromised its ability to support life, and settled in for a protracted siege. In early August, the Il Khan himself visited the operation and conferred with the Khans. Nicholas's view was stark. The responsibility for the inhabitants of the monastery lay with the leadership of the Chosen, and if they didn't surrender, the loss of life and operations to take the complex would be laid squarely at their feet. A final ultimatum was delivered to the defenders on the 30th of September, and was ignored. On the morning of the 1st of October, Khan Elam offered and ordered the periphery buildings of the complex to be shelled. When this too failed to elicit a response, Scorpion troops began to work their way into the complex, seizing control of the power and atmosphere processing facilities before forcing entry to the main complex. There was scattered resistance from the occupants, but the defence was much less vigorous than expected and lacked coordination. The reason soon became apparent. On the order of the cult leader, many of the occupants had committed suicide rather than be taken prisoner, and of those who remained, roughly half of the 1,500 inhabitants of the monastery, many were suffering from malnutrition. Escher was not among those who committed suicide, though many of her ruling clique were, and she was taken into Scorpion custody. A swift trial followed and Escher was executed on the 19th of October. Khan Elam carried out the sentence himself, ejecting Escher from one of the citadel's airlocks. Secondary targets, Garda and Tenno. Garda and Tenno were lightly populated compared to the other four continents of Dagda and their inhabitants believed to be easy prey to the fire mandrels and goliath scorpions. The city-states of Garda fell easily despite the fire mandrel bickering, its rocky uplands among the least hospitable land on Dagda, with a commensurately small populace. Tenno proved a more significant challenge for the goliath scorpions. Like many of Dagda's landmasses, the inland regions of Tenno were uplands, incapable of supporting life, and so most of the settlements had been established on the continental fringes. There was one notable exception, a mining installation established in the heart of the uplands and centred on a mountain called Black Mesa. 
Materials from this site were fueling arms production, including some of the most advanced systems still manufactured on planet. The faction controlling the site, the Drakkers, had made significant riches selling their weaponry to the other factions, and had used the money to build some of the toughest defences on Dagda outside of Firebase Delta, and the near legendary Black Brian on San Biagio. The Draka were also reported to have at least two lancers of battle mechs, backed by another company of armed industrial mechs, with a significant part of their forces already committed to maintaining order on Reaver, Elam and Scott faced a stiff challenge at Black Mesa, and knew that in the thin atmosphere of the uplands, their losses would be exacerbated. Aerial reconnaissance of the facility proved inconclusive, as many defensive emplacements were built into the rock and difficult to spot from above, while a vast network of tunnels allowed the defenders to move around at will. Knowing this, Khan Elam considered calling in troop deployments from other clans, but Sarkhan Scott argued that doing so would suggest weakness on the part of the Scorpions. This was something they had to do for themselves. On the 17th of November, scout elements of the Scorpion Talman began probing the Black Mesa defences, quickly uncovering a number of defensive installations and identifying key approaches to the complex. The Draka were cunning, and they deliberately held back some of their defences until the Scorpions were committed to a particular approach. Once they did, the opposition opened fire and attacked with mechs from concealed tunnel entrances. Of the three combined arms binaries the Scorpions took against Black Mesa, only one made it to the complex without losses. Elam knew that his weakened force stood little chance of capturing the facility, and he had only limited infantry with which to invade the facility, and didn't want a repeat of the troubles on Reaver. He took one of the most unusual steps in the campaign. After speaking to the Ilkhan and receiving the use of special assets, he offered to negotiate with the Draka leader, Prene Sawant. Sawant was a pragmatist, a businessman as much as a warrior, and he knew that while he did stand a chance of holding off the Scorpions, doing so risked his facility and his livelihood. By negotiating he had a chance to save both, though he'd heard stories of Esh's fate on Reva, and had little reason to suspect the Khan would offer him anything else. Most likely he'd face bluster and threats and then end up facing this Clan Khan on the battlefield. As expected, the negotiations soon soured, and a confrontation was inevitable. Elam retained the trump card, however, and as Sawant was about to walk away, he provided a show of force that convinced the Draka leader that the only way to save his people was to surrender to the clans. In the tribunal that followed, Sawant was accused and convicted on numerous charges, but thanks to the testimony of Khan Elam, who appeared as a character witness, having been impressed by Sawant's determination and desire to protect his people, the expected death sentence was commuted to a term of imprisonment aboard the Prince Eugen. After his release and the amnesty that followed Nicholas Kerensky's death, Sawant was inducted into the Goliath Scorpions and rose to prominence in their technician cast, laying a significant role in adapting the clan's manufactories to aid in the rebuilding of the Pentagon. Dratha Redux By the start of September, the Baroques and Widowmakers had concluded operations against Ryan's Roughnecks and the Oriented Dominion. Both groups outnumbered the clans, mustering dozens of tanks and hundreds of infantry as well as a smattering of mechs. However, neither had solid cohesion or leadership, and their efforts to rebuff Kerensky's forces was ill-disciplined and scattered. Solidly organised, well-led and maintaining constant communications, the Baroques and Widowmakers cut through the defenders like a hot knife through butter, constantly adapting their strategy to reflect the enemy defences. Counterattacks were blunted and turned back, and in many cases, simply annihilated, and when the Dominion defence collapsed, the Widowmakers pounced and captured the enemy HQ six days ahead of schedule, undertaking a leisurely mop-up operation against the Remnants. The Baroque offensive against the Roughnecks didn't benefit from such an event, with the Dagden troops staging a series of rearguard actions and a dogged defence of their last stronghold. Nonetheless, the staid Baroques still crushed the opposition a day ahead of schedule. September and October saw the two clans working around the coast, the Baroques clockwise and the Widowmakers anti-clockwise, smashing several recalcitrant military enclaves as they did. A number of groups associated with the Dominion and the Roughnecks capitulated when the larger organisations collapsed, but several did choose to resist, either through bravado or realisation that their crimes meant the clans would show them scant mercy. Matters shifted markedly though on the 22nd of October, when an assassin fired at Widowmaker Sarkhan Marielle Sanders as she inspected a recently captured and supposedly secure village. 
The assassin, posing as a trader, was slain almost immediately by the other members of the Sarkhan's entourage, an action that, while lauded as an appropriate martial response, drew criticism from the Ilkhan for depriving the clans of the chance to interrogate the perpetrator. Sander's wounds weren't immediately fatal, and after field treatment she was medevaced to the Widowmaker HQ at Falker. It soon became apparent that her injuries were more severe than first thought, and she was evacuated to the SLS Moorfields, a Condor-class medical dropship, where she died on the 22nd of October, the most senior clan officer to perish in the Dagden campaign. The remaining Widowmakers suspended combat operations and withdrew to the town of Sunflower, a bleak mining settlement nestled in the foothills of the Gresson Range. While Nicholas nominated the initial Khans of each clan, the determination of subsequent leaders was left in the hands of the existing membership. Replacing Sanders was the first time these provisions had come into effect, though it wouldn't be the last in the campaign. The Widowmaker Conclave debated for two days, eventually settling on Cal Jorgensen as the new Junior Khan. Outspoken and abrasive, the newly installed Sarkhan immediately gained the ire of the Fire Mandrels and Goliath Scorpions by calling their operations a sideshow and a badly organised one at that. Cyrus Elam took grave exception to this and demanded a trial by combat, but the Ilkhan refused to sanction any combat between his officers until Dagda was pacified. The dispute between Elam and Jorgensen would remain a fixture in Scorpion Widowmaker relations throughout the next decade, becoming particularly heated after Jorgensen became senior Khan following the Wolverine Crisis. Indeed, Elam would eventually die in combat against Widowmaker Sarkhan Kyle Voldemark on Roche in 2834, during the coursing of the Widowmakers that followed Nicholas's death. The loss of Sarkhan Sanders filled the Widowmakers with a cold fury that the final enclaves on Drafa were forced to endure. The bereaved clan showed little mercy, dealing harshly with any who opposed them. Few of the Dagden troops were given the opportunity to surrender, they were all guilty of the assassination in Khan Kerriger's eyes, and damage to the already battered civilian infrastructure increased markedly. They got the job done, but the Ilkhan began to worry about the prospects for the final leg of the campaign the assault on San Biagio, and the Black Brian. The Legend of the Ghostly Sea Wolf While Dagda's landmasses were generally inimical to life, the planet's extensive oceans were the opposite, and teemed with flora and fauna. In the waters, the abundance of nutrients, and more importantly oxygen, allowed Dagda's only large animals to evolve, including analogues for whales, seals, and dolphins, the latter showing social and linguistic skills comparable to that of Terra's chimpanzees. Together with fish and plankton, these provided a valuable resource for the colonists to exploit, and vast ocean-going vessels were developed to weather the great storms that racked the world. Known as atolls, these constructs were to all intents man-made islands from which small vessels could operate, either exploiting the ocean's resources or as a platform for exploiting the mineral riches of the seabed. Most of the atolls were abandoned after Nicholas's exodus, some due to enemy action, but most due to a lack of resources to maintain them. Only three remained active when the clans returned, and the Fire Mandrels and Goliath Scorpions were given the task of securing them. Bidding for the right to capture the facilities was fierce, driven low by the Mandrels' internal rivalries. In the end, the Mandrels won the right to stage two operations, and the Scorpions the third. In each case, the bidding eliminated mechs from the assault forces and left infantry with the honour of liberating the atolls. The warriors would have to rely on guile and their own martial prowess to win over the enemy. Success would shower them with glory, failure might relegate their genetics to second-class status in Nicholas's new breeding programme. On Mimosa and Penn atolls, the Mandrels quickly achieved their objectives. The former willingly surrendered, the latter doing so after the clan's willingness to simply sink the facility with their shuttle's heavy weapons was made clear. On Kepler Atoll, target of the Goliath Scorpions, David Madsen and Naomi Jurassi, matters were considerably bloodier. The rulers of the Atoll initially welcomed the clan warriors and agreed to their terms for surrender, but as the clan troops prepared their shuttle to depart, they came under attack. Madsen killed five of his attackers before being felled when his pistol jammed, his body thrown into the sea. Jurassi downed another four but was captured and dragged before the potentate, Marco Y, who had, a little while earlier, appeared to welcome the scorpions with open arms. 
He laughed at Jurassic's threats of great reprisals by the clans, then sat and watched as his men tortured the clanner before throwing her abused body into a pool with several captive sea wolves. Jurassic later said that she drowned there, her body sinking into the depths before one of the sea wolves, whom the Keplans expected to consume her as they had countless previous victims before, dragged her soul back to the land of the living. In truth, the beast saved her from drowning, perhaps recognising a fellow victim of the Keplan inhabitants. Even in 2821, the rudimentary intelligence of the native sea wolf was known, leading to them being dubbed Dagdon Dolphins, though in size and manner they are closer to the Orsinus genus uh, than the Terciops bottlenose dolphin. Believing her dead, the human inhabitants of the atoll had resumed their normal routine. Little did they know their daily life was about to become a nightmare. Jurassic knew she was grossly outnumbered. Intelligence estimates postulated about 2,500 inhabitants, and even uninjured, taking the war back to the Keplans would have been tantamount to suicide. Instead, she began a reign of terror, staging swift, deadly attacks on unsuspecting inhabitants. She followed no set pattern, sometimes waiting days between attacks, at other times striking multiple times in an hour. Fifteen days after the ambush, with fifty of his warriors missing and presumed dead, and the populace of the atoll consumed by fear of the sea wolf, Y found himself face to face with a demon. Jurassic showed no mercy and returned the favour, forcing the chief into the sea wolf pool. This time, the sea wolves didn't hold back, voraciously consuming their tormentor. The clanswoman wasn't yet done. Ordering the population to free the sea wolves, she sabotaged the atoll's main power plant and told the inhabitants to flee. Scorpion recon aircraft witnessed the massive explosion that shattered the atoll, initially mistaking it for a tactical nuclear blast. A shuttlecraft was dispatched to survey the wreckage and recovered Jurassic and a dozen Kaplan civilians from scattered lifeboats. The remains of the atoll itself sunk into one of the deep trenches, and it would be almost 20 years before the clans developed diving suits sufficiently resilient to allow exploration of the wreck. Jurassic received considerable acclaim for her success. Her determination and prowess became distinctive traits of what would become one of the Scorpion's key elemental bloodlines. But she barely spoke of the incident, and on those few occasions, usually only with regard to her death and rebirth in the Seawolf Pool. The Siege of the Black Brian By the start of 2822, only one continent remained outside of clan control. San Biagio, in the Eastern Hemisphere, site of the massive cache fortress known as the Black Brian. It had been expected that the four clans assigned to Dagda would undertake joint operations against the Black Brian, but their performances worried Nicholas. The fire mandrels were enmeshed in their own disputes and running behind schedule. In their mop-up operations, the Goliath Scorpions had taken excessive losses at Satan's Table and Black Mesa. The Widowmakers were taking out their frustrations on the very people they come to rescue. Only the Baroques had performed as projected, which was slowly and surely not something Kerensky wanted to rely on for a difficult operation ahead. To the chagrin of the Mandrels and Scorpions, the Ilkhan decided that a proven force be used to crack the enemy defences. Clans Wolf and Jade Falcon. Though recognising the need for the extra forces and initially appreciative of the aid, tensions between the Khans of the newly arrived force and those already on world quickly reached a boiling point. The Scorpions in particular became offended by the newcomers when the Jade Falcons were assigned the prestigious lead role in the assault on the Black Brian while they were relegated to rear echelon guard duty, maintaining order in several still rebellious areas which continued to simmer well into 2822. The Falcon Infantry Commander, Carl Ikaza didn't help matters by denigrating Scorpion Sarkhan Scott's abilities, likening her to a cadet. That Scott and Ikaza were former lovers who'd parted on less than amicable terms didn't help matters, and when the Scorpions lodged a formal complaint with the Il Khan, Nicholas cited the personal animosity between the officers as a factor in his decision to bench the Scorpions. The Mandrel and Scorpion roles in the Dagda campaign were effectively over. The Brotherhood of Donegal was the principal faction on San Biagio and had seized the fortress later known as the Black Brian in the early years of the Exodus Civil War. Sitting astride the sole low-level pass through the Thorin Mountains, the Brotherhood's fortress was one of Alexander Kerensky's original depot sites and followed a standard Starleague design. 
unlike many of the other depots, which were overrun and consumed by various factions in the decades of the Civil War, the Blackbriar had been controlled by the Brotherhood almost from the start of the conflict. Repeated attacks by enemy groups failed to capture the facility, though the scorching and scarring on the walls led to the Black Appellation. The site's official designation was the snappy Brian Cash Dag-92-906. The clans could have circumvented the fort. They, unlike the Dagden factions, could make suborbital fights and bypass the site, but every pocket of resistance had to be crushed. Nicholas assigned the principal assault on the Bastion to Clan Jade Falcon, with the wolves charged with securing the pass and the territory beyond, and with the Baroque and Widowmaker clan securing a series of secondary objectives. The Ilkhan himself commanded the assault on the Black Brian, stalking the battlefield in his atlas. Though nearly 60, Nicholas showed the vigour of a much younger man, driven by his desire to bring a close to the Pentagon campaign that had, in December on Eden, claimed the life of his brother. Nonetheless, the campaign to take control of the fortifications was a protracted affair, earning it the nickname the Siege of the Black Brian. In the early weeks of March, the Baroques and Widowmakers secured the immediate environs of the fortress and established aerospace superiority, staging regular reconnaissance flights near the fortress and establishing the extent of the complex's anti-air weaponry. Near simultaneously, the Wolves forced the Thorin Pass, weathering withering fire from the fortress's fixed gun emplacements. Wolf detachments poured into the land beyond the pass and during March eradicated the scattered resistance to clan rule. However, while the fortress remained there was no secure overland route, and Nicholas ordered the Falcons into action, tasking them with eliminating the exterior defences of the complex and allowing free passage by and over the Brian. Lisa Buhalan led her star of assault troops against the Black Brian, and in a series of hit-and-run operations successfully cleared all the weapon emplacements threatening the pass. Buhalan's determination and cunning earned her praise from both Khan Elizabeth Hazen and Ilkhan, Nicholas himself, joining the relief force that provided covering fire for Bahalan's eventual withdrawal. Though injuries received in the fight would end her career as a mech warrior, her leadership skills and intelligence would earn her a place in the highest offices of her clan. After the battle, she was named Sarkhan, and the Falcon's first war master. It's her writings that detail the origins of the Jade Falcon clan and provide many of the details relating to their involvement in the Pentagon campaigns on Eden and Dagda. While the fortress's teeth had been pulled, it remained a threat to the clan occupation, with Donegal mechs able to launch lightning raids from a variety of entrances, then retreat before an effective counterattack could be mounted. Calling together all the Khans of the clans on Dagda, Nicholas outlined his plans for the final assault on the fortress. Unlike Black Mesa, where Cyrus Elam's threat of overwhelming force prompted the defenders to surrender, the clans would have to break into the fortress and clear it from within. The Deep Cache was largely immune to tactical weapons, and in any case Nicholas wanted the materials and the cache for use for the clans. Clans Fire Mandrel, Goliath Scorpion, Barok and Widowmaker would form a security cordon, guarding all known entrances and exits to the complex. The Wolves would lead the assault operations, gaining entry to the complex, and securing the breaches. But as he'd promised them, the Jade Falcons would mount the actual assault into the fortress. Operation Ferret began on the 2nd of April, 2822, with a simultaneous assault on three gates by the Wolves. Designed to weather even the heaviest assaults, the gates and their approaches posed a serious challenge. Any approach would be under the cover of numerous gun emplacements, albeit of small calibre compared to those of the Falcons that already knocked out, as well as fire from murder holes. In stark contrast, the attackers would be limited in the number of weapons they could bring to bear due to the narrow and winding approaches. By assaulting multiple positions, the walls hoped to overstretch the defenders, giving them the chance to gain entry. A binary of mechs were assigned to each assault, with two more as a mobile reserve to exploit weaknesses. The first two gates stood firm, but at the third, a combination of mech firepower and combat engineers brought down a section of the gate. The Wolf Reserve joining the fray to beat back a lasser ditch Donegal attempt to retake the gate. The Dagden effort failed, and with their outer defences breached, the Brotherhood withdrew deeper into the complex. By midnight, all three gates were breached, and the Jade Falcons pushed past the Wolves and advanced deep into the Black Brian. Hopes of a quick victory were soon dashed, 
as the ex Lyran troops mounted a dogged defence. They knew the complex, and its defence as well, and they used them to stage a series of ambushes. Lisa Buhalan described the operation as a game of cat and mouse, though the mouse has a 200mm autocannon, and so the cat has every reason to feel nervous. Nicholas's timetable called for the crushing of resistance in the Blackbriar by mid-April. In reality, while the Donegal mech forces were eliminated within 10 days, it would be weeks before the final Brotherhood trooper was in clan hands after a hard-fought subterranean campaign that pitted cunning and improvised traps against the Jade Falcon's determination. During the fight, Jerome Winston offered his wolves as a relief force to allow the Falcons a brief respite. Elizabeth Hazen refused the operation, which lasted 54 days, would be among the longest of the Pentagon campaign. When she emerged from the complex, escorting the last prisoner, the Falcon Khan was surprised to see the Khans of the other 19 clans assembled for a grand council. To resounding cheers, Nicholas announced that with the fall of the Black Brian, and after 14 months of conflict, Operation Klondike was over. <laughs>